This is a video for Aiken scholars on molecular orbital theory. So if we can think about chemical bonds, covalent bonds as being shared pairs of electrons, we can also think about them as overlapping orbitals from atom to atom. And another way of thinking about them is to picture all of the atomic orbitals from the whole atom and from all of the atoms in the molecule we can picture those combining completely across the whole molecule into completely new molecule completely new orbitals which we call molecular orbitals and so the key for hybrid orbitals was that the orbitals that mixed had to come from the same atom but for molecular orbitals the orbitals that mix come from different atoms and not only do they come from different atoms, but for them to mix effectively or hybridize effectively across the whole molecule, they have to be the same orbitals. They have to be the same kinds of orbitals. And so, again, we see that the number of molecular orbitals formed is still equal to the total number of atomic orbitals that were combined. And these molecular orbitals represent discrete energy states for the whole molecule, with the orbitals sometimes spread out over the entire molecule. Here's a couple of examples of some molecules and the molecular orbitals that we might see for them. See the one in the top left where you see some red and green orbitals. Notice that those are above and below the plane of the molecule. And the plane of the molecule for that part of the molecule is basically within the plane of the page. That molecule there is actually an example of a chlorophyll. And the green atom in the center would be magnesium. The two blue atoms that you can somewhat see near it are nitrogens. There are two other nitrogens that are also near that magnesium. And for that particular molecular orbital, we see that the sum of the atoms have orbital overlap between them, but that that orbital overlap is not necessarily connecting all the atoms together in the molecule. So that tells us that for certain molecules, rather for certain atoms, that particular molecular orbital is better at connecting those particular atoms, but that those electrons are not going to flow back and forth across the whole molecule. If we come clockwise from there, we see this very interesting thiophene oligomer, which consists of all these linked pentagons or pentagonal rings. And the highest occupied molecular orbital, and we'll explain what that means in a few more slides. The highest occupied molecular orbital, notice, has a lot of breaks between the atoms. Those blue and red shadings, which are supposed to represent um, different lobes of that molecular orbital, they do overlap between two atoms in each of those cases, but there's a lot of gaps between those along the whole molecule. And so for certain atoms, it's bonding, and for other atoms, it's not. If we look below that for the LUMO, the LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And notice that that LUMO orbital, we see that red shape extending across almost the whole length of the molecule. And that represents that those electrons are spread along the whole chain of the molecule. And that because those electrons are shared between all of those atoms, that actually makes those bonds within that molecular chain very strong and very stable, very low in energy. And so if there were electrons there, they would be free to move back and forth. There's all sorts of interesting stuff that goes on then with um, spectroscopy and colors of molecules. And then for one of the simplest molecules that we can see, there's formaldehyde. Recall that we looked at formaldehyde for hybrid, hybrid orbitals, and the hybridization of that carbon would have been sp2 in order to be able to form the one pi bond with the oxygen, and the oxygen was an sp2. And then in the case of the formaldehyde there, you can see that there's some orbital overlap between the carbon and the two hydrogens with the top two that are there that are shown. In that case, the, the red and the blue in the bottom are bonding. They're increasing the electron density between the carbon and the hydrogens. So that's a good orbital for those bonds. On the bottom with the formaldehyde, notice that this molecule has been rotated in terms of their perspective. 
One of those hydrogens is now pointing towards us. The other hydrogen is pointing away. And the orbitals that are shown there on the right side line up with that. Even though this looks very similar to the one above, the molecule has been rotated, but we're now looking at a different molecular orbital. And that particular molecular orbital doesn't really increase the electron density between any of the atoms. And so that one is not really contributing to the bonding. With all these, what we can see is we can see that when these molecular orbitals increase electron density between atoms, they increase the stability of the molecule. And so those molecular orbitals are called bonding orbitals. The molecular orbitals, like in the case of the formaldehyde, where they don't increase the electron density between any atoms, we call those anti-bonding orbitals. They don't help these atoms stay together. If we put electrons into those orbitals, it would actually raise the energy of the molecule and it could cause the molecule to fall apart. And so here we have the summary bonding orbitals are a region of these molecular orbitals that increase the electron density between the atoms, between the nuclear centers. If that happens, then that energy is lowered for the molecule, it's more stable than the atomic orbitals from which they're formed, and so the molecule is more stable as a molecule than as the separate atoms. If these molecular orbitals don't increase the electron density between the atoms, if they actually push that electron density away from the nuclear centers, then we are lowering the stability of the molecule if we put electrons into those orbitals. And so the key when we make molecular orbitals or when we think about molecular orbitals for molecules is we always want to have electrons in the bonding orbitals and we don't want to have electrons in the anti-bonding orbitals if we're trying to have the strongest bonds possible. To figure this out, this is not something you're going to have to do. Chemists look at what's called a molecular orbital diagram. You should be able to take a diagram if it was given to you and fill it up from the lowest energy to the highest using the Aufbau principle. This works the same way as the orbital diagrams for the atoms. And when we put electrons into those MO diagrams, we see that there are certain kinds of orbitals, and we call those molecular orbitals sigma orbitals and pi orbitals. This is actually where the terminology comes from for those single and double or triple bonds. And the sigma bond um, increases, or the sigma orbitals, increase the electron density <clears throat> directly along the bond axis. And the pi molecular orbitals, or the pi bonds, again, um, increase electron density between the atoms, but not necessarily directly along the bonding axis between those two atoms. But this is where the terms come from. And these sigma bonds result, again, from orbitals overlapping that are pointing directly at each other and the pi bonds result from orbitals that are overlapping when they are parallel to each other. So one of the simplest molecules we can look at with the molecular orbital idea is that of hydrogen. If we picture the two spherical S orbitals from the hydrogen, that's two orbitals to start. When they combine, similar to the hybrid orbitals, they can combine constructively or destructively. So again, if we have two orbitals in, we need two orbitals out. The orbital that increases the electron density between the atoms is the bonding orbital. That's the one where we see the lobe, the ellipse, directly between the two hydrogen atoms, and that's what creates the sigma bond. As a bonding orbital, it's called sigma, and we say where the orbitals came from, and they both came from 1s orbitals. The other orbital that comes out of this is the red orbitals that are shown above, where there's a gap between the two hydrogens, this orbital would decrease electron density between the two atoms. And so this is an anti-bonding orbital. And in the molecular orbital diagram that's shown on the right side, we see that that sigma has a star or an asterisk with it to indicate that it is an anti-bonding orbital. In the case of that hydrogen, it's easy to look at that hydrogen and look at how many electrons are there. There's two electrons in that sigma orbital. If we take that number and divide it by two, that gives us the bond order for those two atoms. And the bond order for hydrogen with a single bond is one, and that's what we get if we take those two electrons and divide by two. 
If we look at bond order for other molecules where there are electrons in antibonding orbitals, we still do the same kind of math, but we take the number of electrons in the bonding orbital, so the two electrons in that bottom sigma orbital for the H2 minus, two minus one electron from the antibonding orbital, the sigma star, which gives us one, and again we divide by two, which gives us an overall bond order of one half. Notice this is not zero. Notice that this tells us that H2 minus does still have some bonding character that those two hydrogen atoms could still be attached to one another. In this molecule, this ion can in fact form. It forms in the atmosphere and it forms in space, but because its bond order is only one half, it's not as stable as the neutral hydrogen molecule would be. Um, but it does stay together. Versus helium, if we took two helium atoms and put them together, each of the two helium atoms starts out with two electrons. When we put those two electrons into the molecular orbital diagram, we have two electrons in the bonding orbital, two electrons in the antibonding orbital, two minus two is zero, zero over two is still zero. And so the bond order for diatomic helium would be zero, and this molecular orbital diagram gives us uh, additional reasoning or additional evidence for why helium itself doesn't form bonds to other helium atoms. So there are some guidelines if you're trying to draw molecular orbitals or if you're trying to fill in the molecular orbital diagrams. Again, the total number of molecular orbitals has to be equal to the number of atomic orbitals that were mixed. Orbitals with similar energy and shape are going to mix more effectively than do those of different energy and shape because there's larger energy, energy gaps between them. So a 1s orbital is going to mix better with a 1s orbital. A 1s orbital might mix a little bit with a 2s orbital, but they do have larger energy differences between them. But a 1s orbital and a 2p orbital would be poor for mixing because they're in different shells and they also have different shapes. And so it's a question of degree, and you could almost think of it as like a three strikes and you're out kind of thing, I guess. Um, that's also the orbitals of different n, orbitals of different shells, if they're trying to overlap, result in less effective mixing, again, because of the large energy gaps. Every molecular orbital can accommodate two electrons, just like every atomic orbital can hold two electrons. And electrons, again, fill molecular orbital diagrams according to both the off-bow principle, Hund's rule, and also Pauli exclusion principle. And so if we look at something like, say, oxygen, O2, this is a little complex, but each oxygen has eight total electrons. The two electrons in the 1s from each atom we're not going to worry about. So in the valence, we're only looking at six. So we've got two electrons in the 2s, four electrons in the 2p. The 2s electrons from each oxygen will mix and give you two molecular orbitals. One is bonding, one is antibonding. We don't get any benefit there for the bonding from those orbitals. The 2p orbitals from the oxygens will mix. Those 2p's, remember, lie along the x, y, and z axes. The 2p orbitals that are pointing at each other will overlap and will give us both bonding and antibonding sigma orbitals. Those are going to be the lowest and the highest energy orbitals in this molecular orbital diagram for oxygen. The bonding sigma orbital will fill in with two electrons. The other p orbitals that are pointing on the um, orthogonal or the 90 degree axes to the sigma bond, those will overlap in a parallel method and because they overlap when they're parallel to each other, that results in pi orbitals. There's two p orbitals from each of the atoms, so there's a total of four p orbitals coming together, which means we get four pi orbitals out. Two of those pi orbitals are bonding. Two of those pi orbitals are anti-bonding. When we place all of those electrons into that molecular orbital diagram, we see that there are two unpaired electrons up in one of the antibonding pi orbitals. But what we see is we have a total of six pi electrons that are six electrons that are in bonding orbitals 
So six in bonding minus two in antibonding gives us four, and four divided by two again gives us two. This is what we think about when we think about oxygen. Oxygen has two bonds. Oxygen has a double bond. However, when we draw the Lewis structure, we do not typically show the oxygen molecule with unpaired electrons. All the electrons in the O2 are paired in the Lewis structure. This molecular orbital diagram is showing us that there are two electrons that are unpaired. This is very interesting because this molecular orbital diagram actually helps us explain why oxygen is magnetic. So here's a picture of liquid oxygen that is uh, suspended between two magnets. And um, there are videos of this on YouTube and you can watch them pour the liquid oxygen in and you can watch it get trapped between the two magnets. And this idea of magnetism in the oxygen molecular orbital diagram comes in because of those two unpaired electrons. If those two unpaired electrons were not there in this molecular orbital diagram, then the O2 would be diamagnetic like the Lewis structure predicts. Diamagnetic, again, is when all the electrons are paired. And diamagnetic atoms and molecules are actually repelled by magnetic fields. But in the case of this oxygen, because of those two unpaired electrons, when you have unpaired electrons, you are paramagnetic, and you're actually attracted to magnetic fields. This is a situation where the Lewis structure does not quite explain the behavior, but the molecular orbitals do. And again, the molecular orbitals are much more useful than Lewis structures at much higher levels of chemistry, especially in things like organic chemistry when you look at how molecules react. Also, when you look at the interaction between molecules and biology, molecules and receptors, things like neurotransmitters, this is not all just based off the shape of the molecules, but it's also based off of where the electrons are. In many cases, it's the molecular orbitals that are formed by the electrons that dictate the behavior of the molecule. We can look at nitrogen here. Nitrogen has two fewer electrons than the oxygen. Notice everything there is paired. Notice that you could go through and determine the bond order, and it has a bond order of three. That makes sense when we draw the Lewis structure, we see it has a triple bond. But again, all the electrons here are completely paired. So nitrogen would be an example of a molecule that is diamagnetic, where everything is paired, whether we look at the Lewis structure or whether we look at the molecular orbital. Again, we need to look at the molecular orbital to be able to explain why oxygen is magnetic. Now again, I hope you join us in the discussion. I hope you join us in the online chat. Um, to share some of your thoughts from this, any questions that you have, and check out the quizzes to see some questions based on molecular orbitals as well.